Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon. Episode 4, Marshal Serurier and Marshal Lefebvre, Duke of Danzig. Before we get into our stories, I'd like to let our audience know about our social media channels. On Twitter and Instagram, we can be found with the handle at and Napoleon. And on Facebook, we can be found at Generals and Napoleon. As always, we appreciate any follows, likes, or comments. Now, on to our stories. We begin with a marshal known as the Virgin of Italy. No, it's not what you think. Marshal Sururi received this moniker from his troops for his rigid discipline and his prevention of looting in conquered territories. This was a rare trait amongst his contemporaries. Some of his brother marshals, like Brune, Massena, Ajaru, and Sult, were considered world-class looters. However, we must consider the maxim of the time, which was, quote, war should pay for war, end quote, meaning the conquered territories should be subjugated to taxes and plundering to pay for their liberation. Jean Mathieu Philibert Serurier was born in Lone, France on December 8, 1742. He became a soldier at the young age of 13 and it would take him 34 years to reach the rank of major. Such was the lot of soldiers in the Royal French Army before the Revolution and before Napoleon. He was described as a slow thinking man, reliable, honest, and courageous. He stubbornly adhered to drill book methods of leading his men. These methods were initially praised by Napoleon, who spoke favorably of his qualities during their first Italian campaign. His father was Mathieu Guillaume Serurier, who was employed as the royal mole catcher at the King of France's horse stables. Yes, that was a real job in the King's service. I did a little research and apparently a single mole can make 30 molehills a day, which, multiplied a hundredfold, can make it t- entire estates pockmarked with mounds of dirt. In fact, in 1702, King William III of England died at the age of 52 after his horse allegedly tripped on a molehill. This job position was created by Louis XIV to protect the royal gardens at Versailles, and there's still a mole catcher employed to this very day. But back to our story. Because of their minor nobility, young Serurier was able to get a good education and received a commission as lieutenant in 1755. During the Seven Years' War, he saw combat many times and the dangers that come with it. He suffered a bayonet wound and later in 1760 at the Battle of Warburg, He took a bullet to the right side of his face, which broke his jaw and knocked out most of his teeth. The injury left a lasting scar, which gave him the appearance of an older, more experienced soldier. After the Seven Years' War ended in 1763, Serurier was demoted to Solon's lieutenant and spent six years as a drill instructor. These skills of honing raw troops were to serve him well in the future Italian campaigns of Napoleon. From 1770 to 1774, Serurier was stationed on the island of Napoleon's birth, Corsica, to help suppress an insurrection there. 1779 brought two significant accomplishments. He was finally promoted to captain, 24 years to get that promotion, and married his wife that same year, Louise Marie Etasse daughter of the registrar of bail bondsmen in Lone. They had no children, but adopted the daughter of one of his wounded troops in 1814. This girl was named Marguerite, and she lived until 1854. They adopted another girl named Clarissa Elise Lanchamp, who inherited the family's assets. Nine years after his marriage and promotion to captain, he was still a captain of a chasseur's regiment, but he was annoyed by this lack of promotion. He submitted a request to retire, but his commanding officer dismissed the idea 
and instead promoted him to major. In 1791, he was promoted again to lieutenant colonel, but it was a perilous time due to his long service in the king's army. The revolutionary government suspected him of having royalist sympathies. However, in 1793, he was finally promoted to brigadier general and was sent to the Army of Italy. Three years later, in March of 1796, the leading generals of the Army of Italy, Massena, Algeru, and Serurier, were summoned to meet their new commanding officer, Napoleon Bonaparte who was half the age of Serurier. I can imagine them whispering to Napoleon's chief of staff, Berthier, he can't be any good. He must be a political appointee or a very good friend of the government in Paris. To which Berthier may have responded, you're about to find out how good he is. Indeed, the army of Italy under Napoleon reeled off victory after victory. At Montenot, at Melissimo, Dago, Seva, Mondovi, Fambio, Lodi, Borghetto, Lanato, Castiglione, Bassano, Arcole, and Rivole. Amongst the commanding officers in the Army of Italy, Serurier stood out due to his strict rules on looting and stealing from local inhabitants. This was the polar opposite of the two other senior commanders, Massena and Algeru who were considered incorrigible looters and took anything that wasn't bolted down from conquered territories. For this reputation of honesty and intolerance of corruption, Serurier received their nickname, the Virgin of Italy. During April of 1796, he conducted his finest performance at the Battle of Mondovi against the Sardinians. As Marshal Marmont recalled later, quote, Surrier formed his men into three columns, put himself at the head of the central one, threw out a cloud of skirmishers, and marched at the double, sword in hand, ten paces in front of his column, a fine spectacle, that of an old general, resolute and decided, whose vigor was revived by the presence of the enemy. I accompanied him in this attack, the success of which was complete. End quote. Following this French victory, the Sardinians sued for peace. This allowed Napoleon to focus on the armies of Austria and their main fortress of Mantua. When the Austrians were driven into Mantua, Napoleon entrusted Serrier with the siege. The Austrian army in the fortress numbered 14,000 troops. Serrier only had 10,000 to use on the siege. But his clever control of the marshes and bridges allowed the French to hem in the Austrians. Unfortunately, Serrurier caught malaria in these marshes and was incapacitated for a while. The Austrians sent four different relief forces to rescue their troops at Mantua, but Napoleon crushed each one. Finally, after Napoleon's signature victory at Rivoli, the Austrians surrendered the fort in February of 1797. It was reported that 7,000 French troops died during the siege. The Austrians suffered over two times that number of casualties and lost 325 cannons to Napoleon. In June, Serrurier was dispatched to Paris with 22 captured battle standards to display Napoleon's accomplishments to the government. Following peace with Austria, Serrurier was not employed by Napoleon during the Egyptian conquest because he thought the general was too old for such a difficult campaign. Plus, he was still recovering from his bout with malaria during the Mantua siege. Following Napoleon's departure, the Austrians and Russians reclaimed Italy under the relentless Russian general Suvorov. Serrurier and the French army lost battle after battle. At the Battle of Verdio, Serrurier and his 7,000 troops fought a desperate engagement against an army three times their size, and eventually had to surrender. He was released on parole around the same time Napoleon returned from Egypt. Due to the French army's defeats, the French government sank in popularity, and Serrurier supported Napoleon's coup in 1799. 
Napoleon named him one of his four honorary marshals amongst the original 18 marshals in 1804. It was said no one had done less to deserve their marshal's baton at the time, except maybe Bessier. But Napoleon was witness to his abilities during the Italian campaigns. The emperor never employed him in the field again, but made him governor of Les Invalides in Paris. He took great pride in this position, looking after wounded and retired veterans of Napoleon's army. In 1808, he was made a Count of the Empire and received an annual payment of 40,000 francs. In 1814, as the Allies neared Paris and looked unstoppable, Serurier took the 1,400 captured colors and standards of Napoleon's enemies and burned them, lest these trophies fall back into enemy hands. Just to put that number into perspective, in the 17 years since Serurier originally came to Paris, With 22 battle standards, Napoleon and his general had amassed over 1,000 more during that time. Unfortunately, for posterity's sake, Serurier also burned the sash and sword of Frederick the Great, which were captured during Napoleon's conquest of Prussia. When King Louis XVIII returned to the throne, he made Serurier a peer of France, but he lost this position, his title as Marshal, and his post at Les Invalides when he supported Napoleon's return to power. Despite his support of Napoleon, he voted for the execution of Marshal Ney when the king returned. In 1819, the king relented and restored his title and salary of Marshal, but he later died in December of that year, with his wife dying eight years later in 1828. Serurier's battle record was two wins and six losses. He was definitely not the most brilliant of Napoleon's marshals, but he was among the most honest. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Marshal Lefebvre, Duke of Danzig, might be my favorite marshal for pithy quotes. Here's an example. After the downfall of Napoleon, the marshal had accumulated a large amount of wealth and a huge estate. One of his friends was envious of all this, so the marshal replied, quote, Come down the courtyard, and I'll have ten shots at you with a musket from thirty paces away. If I miss, the whole estate is yours. End quote. His friend naturally declined this offer, and Lefebvre added, quote, I had a thousand bullets shot at me from much closer range before I got all this. End quote. Francois Joseph Lefebvre was born in October of 1755 in the region of Alsace, just like his fellow marshal Kellerman. Lefebvre's father had been a hussar in the army but had since become a miller. The good marshal was described as straightforward and kind-hearted with drill-ground humor. He joined the army at the age of 18, and it was to take another 15 years before he would obtain the highest NCO rank of sergeant major. Some historians say his strategic abilities peaked at this rank, even when he was made a marshal by Napoleon. He started out in the elite French guards in 1773, entrusted with the protection of the royal household. He was promoted to corporal five years later in 1778. Five years after that, he became married to his wife, Catherine Hubscher. The marshal's wife can be defined in one word, sassy. Catherine was a salt-of-the-earth, blunt type of person who was very loyal to Napoleon. 
She was also born in Alsace around 1753 and was of commoner origins. She worked as a laundress or washerwoman and was very proud of her humble background. She married the future marshal in 1783 when he was in the Royal Army. As her husband rose through the ranks, the marshal's wife became a member of Napoleon's imperial court. Her frank manners rubbed the elites the wrong way frequently, but she and the emperor seemed not to care. She was also generous to charities and treated her servants well. The marshal's wife attended lavish imperial balls, but seldom danced. She preferred telling scandalous stories with the opening phrase of, quote, when I used to do the washing, end quote. She was also very protective of the emperor and did not tolerate turncoats, as Marshal Bernadotte found out after the fall of Paris in 1814. She called him a traitor to his face after he led a Swedish army against his former emperor and comrades. Marshal Lefebvre helped his wife's rough edges where he could by teaching her how to read and write. One sad part of their marriage was the loss of their children, with 12 of their 14 kids dying in infancy. Of their two surviving sons, one died as a teenager, and the other, during the Russian campaign, having risen to brigadier general. Catherine passed in 1835. 15 years after the marshal's death. In 1788, he made sergeant major. Just when it seemed Lefebvre's career options had hit a ceiling, the French Revolution occurred. After the Prussian invasion and repulsed by the French citizen army, the good marshal sympathized with the revolutionaries. However, he did not forget his duty, twice wounded while protecting the royal family. In 1789, the French guards were disbanded by the government, and Lefebvre was made a lieutenant in the National Guard. This is significant because this promotion could never have happened in the old Royal Army, where officer positions were only available to aristocratic men. He became commander of a grenadier company, where he gained the respect and admiration of his men through bravery and discipline. Because of the knowledge of his profession, and support of the revolution, Lefebvre was promoted rapidly. Captain in 1792, Lieutenant Colonel in 1793, Brigadier General two months later, and finally General of Division in January 1794. Thus it took him just five years to get from Lieutenant to General, a third of the amount of time it took to get from Private to Sergeant Major. On the battlefield, he aided his future brother marshal, Jordan, in the Battle of Flores against the Austrians. Although Jordan was the commanding general in this fight, Lefebvre earned a lion's share of the victory when his division stood firm and launched a decisive counterattack. Lefebvre also had an up-and-coming Colonel Soult as his chief of staff to assist him with strategy. The future marshal, Soult, later claimed he learned much during his time with Lefebvre. An interesting footnote of this battle is that it was the first time a balloon was used for aerial reconnaissance of enemy positions. It was also a desperate battle, costing both sides 5,000 casualties. Soult wrote that it was, quote, 15 hours of the most desperate fighting I ever saw in my life, end quote. After the battle, and against standing orders, the Honorable Lefebvre flat out refused to execute any captured French emigre soldiers taken during the battle. The Battle of Flores cost the Austrians control of Belgium and the Netherlands. By 1799, Lefebvre had been exhausted by continued battles in Germany and received a serious wound, taking a musket ball in the right arm. He retired to Paris to convalesce. During this time, Paris was full of revolutionary spirit yet again, as the Directory government was growing more unpopular by the day. Lefebvre was put in charge of the 17th military district, which included Paris. Napoleon's return from Egypt only added more drama to this stage. The crafty Napoleon knew he had to sway Lefebvre to join his coup d'etat, since Lefebvre controlled the troops in the immediate vicinity of the capital. The story goes 
that Napoleon offered Lefebvre the sword he had carried during his tremendous victory in the Battle of the Pyramids. The old general quickly agreed to Napoleon's intended government overthrow by saying, quote, yes, let us throw the lawyers into the river, end quote. Lefebvre stayed at Napoleon's side during the critical early stages of the coup and was probably happy that a soldier was in control of the government. Napoleon rewarded his loyalty in 1800 with a Senate seat and 35,000 francs annually. In 1804, he would receive another major promotion as one of the original 18 marshals of the empire. Like Kellerman, Perignon, and Serurier, he was considered an honorary marshal, too old for frontline duty, but rewarded for past services rendered. However, of those four, Lefebvre would be the only one to return to the front lines for more glory. After receiving his marshal's coat, a friend complimented him on it, to which Lefebvre replied, quote, It ought to look good. I've been stitching it for 35 years. End quote. Again, he never forgot the hard work it took to get to his lofty position. In 1806, the good marshal was healed from his serious wound and returned to the front lines during the war with Prussia. The emperor, knowing his strategic limitations, placed him in charge of the old guard infantry. These elite troops appreciated the strict disciplinary standards, and he led them into battle during Napoleon's victory at Jena. In 1807, Lefebvre was assigned a difficult task, one that would eventually make him a duke. As the Grand Army advanced into Prussia, there was a major enemy fortress that needed to be subdued. The siege of Danzig began on March 19th and took a long, hard 51 days to accomplish. Many critics of the Marshal believe this should have been completed much earlier, but there are other factors to consider. First, Lefebvre was not trained in siege warfare. He himself was reluctant to take on this challenge. Napoleon stated, quote, your glory is linked to the taking of Danzig. You must go there, end quote. He knew his other marshals were needed at the front lines and couldn't be distracted with a sideshow of 14,000 Prussian soldiers. But Danzig had a vast amount of stores, weapons, and rations that could be appropriated by Napoleon's army. Napoleon gave the good marshal several experts to serve under him. General Chesseloup, head of the engineers, and General Derlon, who would later become a marshal, as his chief of staff, along with 45,000 troops and 100 guns. But as we discussed earlier with Mantua, these sieges can go on for months or even years if fortresses have the ability to be reinforced. The Prussians were being resupplied by sea by the British and received manpower reinforcements from the Russians. As usual, Lefebvre was leading from the front, quoted as saying, Come on, soldiers, it's our turn today, end quote. And he barely rested during the siege, always in the trenches with his men and leading every possible charge. Finally, the corps of Marshal Mortier and Marshal Law showed up to provide backup, and the Prussian commander realized the futility of his situation and surrendered. The French suffered 6,000 casualties, and the Prussians 3,000, along with 1,500 Russians. As a reward for his service, and as part of Napoleon's effort to create a new noble class, he dubbed him the Duke of Danzig. His next command came during Napoleon's personal intervention into Spain. Napoleon's plan was as follows. The two Spanish armies on the left and right of the front were not to be engaged. Napoleon would smash the Spanish middle army like a sledgehammer, then split this hammer into three pieces to curl around each of the Spanish wing armies. Lefebvre and his troops were deployed as a holding force opposite the Spanish left wing. Lefebvre unfortunately lost his control, disobeyed orders, and hurled his holding force against the Spanish army, who fled and escaped Napoleon's pincer movement. The emperor was upset, but the Spanish were eventually beaten across all fronts, 
and the Spanish capital, Madrid, was reconquered by the French armies. In March 1809, Good Marshal was given command of Bavarian troops in Germany. During this time, the no-nonsense Lefebvre gave the citizens of the Franconia region a quick speech on what to expect during his army's occupation. Quote, We come to give you liberty and equality, but don't lose your heads about it. The first person who moves without my permission will be shot. End quote. Napoleon utilized the Fevre and his troops during his victories at Ekmul and Wagram. As usual, the good marshal performed well when under Napoleon's direct supervision. Three years later, Lefebvre was employed during Napoleon's invasion of Russia, where he again led the old guard. Although he was 58 years old, he walked on foot during the return to France from Moscow. He took special care of the emperor during the horrors of the retreat. As Napoleon's army dwindled due to battles, weather, and starvation, Lefebvre handpicked the old guard troops to protect the emperor each night. Unfortunately, his oldest son, Brigadier General Marie Xavier Joseph, was killed during the retreat, and the martial spirit broke. Once back in France, the marshal recuperated both mentally and physically during the year of 1813. When France was invaded the following year, the emperor summoned him, and he returned to the front lines. In February 1814, during Napoleon's famed Six Days campaign, the good marshal was seen leading a charge of the old guard and, quote, foaming at the mouth with his saber hardly resting, end quote. However, it was too little, too late for Napoleon. On April 4th, the Fevre joined a group of marshals that included Ney, Odeno, and MacDonald, who pressured Napoleon to abdicate. During the negotiations, he and Kellerman persuaded the Russian Tsar Alexander to keep Alsace as a French province. The Prussians had been eyeing this territory as spoils of victory. When King Louis XVIII returned, the good marshal swore loyalty to the Bourbons and was created a peer. During the hundred days of Napoleon's return, he did not serve on the front lines, but accepted a seat on Napoleon's Senate which put him under suspicion when the Bourbons returned. After Napoleon's final exile, the good marshal retired to his state and spent time working with charities and visiting the sick. In 1820, with his wife by his side, the good marshal heard the final recall and passed away, two days after his brother Marshal Kellerman. As a commander, Lefebvre can be best summed up as leading by example with personal courage and direct manner. His battle record was eight wins and four losses. The good marshal didn't really participate in the court intrigue and personal rivalries amongst his fellow marshals. He knew his duty was to serve, and serve well he did. Both marshals, Serurier and Lefebvre, were critical to Napoleon at different points in his career. Serurier, during the early stages, and Lefebvre during the middle and late stages. I think this is a good point to finish our episode. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next time when we learn about the indestructible Marshal Odenau.